Okay, it's Karim from uh, Doesn't Matter again. Uh, first day in Australia, in Adelaide, Australia, um, in stage one to two lockdown. So they've closed all pubs, clubs, gyms, which kind of puts me out of business for a while. Um, um, essential travel. Most of the interstate borders, there's uh, six states and two territories in Australia, and most of them have closed their borders today. Queensland, New South Wales, South Australia, Victoria have closed their borders. WA's closed their borders. So pretty much no one's going anywhere except within their state. And then essential travel is um, also monitored within the state. So if you start driving hours and hours across across your state routinely you're going to uh, be asked questions by the police so uh, they're trying to obviously restrict the contamination and um, get people to uh, social distance and minimize their contact with others which makes implicit sense it's standard quarantine practice um, so uh, I'm at home it's uh, about 11 30 at night contemplating going to bed soon but I thought I'd crank out a video just before I hit the sack um, illustrating my first day uh, under the new authority because the emergency powers acts are being played out worldwide at the moment and those emergency powers give states um, very powerful tools to enforce policy um, and I want to add, I think that under the circumstances, they're absolutely appropriate. And if anything, I would argue for even more stringent application of the rules. Um, where they can fall down, and they certainly are here in Australia, is where the, the stringency of the rules is um, imperfectly applied, applied in stages too graduated for the nature of this epidemic or pandemic um, and then the supports that are given as those restrictions impact on society are also too staged and too delayed and cause massive anxiety and worry for um, people uh, workers people in the business community sole proprietors and so on because we're playing catch up constantly with government policy and government policy seems to be in, in, at least here in australia um, generated piecemeal a bit at a time in reaction to things. One of the things I've learned in my study of both politics um, and economics and military history in particular is that reacting to things is generally a very bad idea. Um, you want to get ahead of things. Um, countries like Taiwan and and Singapore and Hong Kong have gotten ahead of the COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic because they have border controlled early. Um, they have imposed strict quarantines, track and trace from the very start. So when they got pockets out breaking, they've been able to stamp those pockets out very, very quickly. Um, it's relatively easy to track people when there's only a few dozen or even a couple of hundred but once there are hundreds and then thousands tracking tracking um people is ludicrous and uh we've had boatloads of people getting off ships and going home to voluntary isolation which is almost meaningless um in practical terms it's unenforced until very recently until today it wasn't enforced and uh, about 5,000, almost 5,000 people got off off cruise ships in the last week. So yeah, Australia's a bit of a mess in terms of policy and trying to get ahead of um, this pandemic. Well, we're not really doing that. Um, we're catching up, we're playing catch up and we all know where catch up goes. You only have to look at Italy and other places to see exactly where catch up policy ends up taking you. So. Um, it is an interesting times that we live in in the, the Chinese sense of the word ironically 
taking it from the proverb, may you live in interesting times, which was also considered by the Chinese to be a curse as much as a blessing. Uh, so indeed, we live in interesting times. Um, I do worry about authoritarian creep. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm concerned about it. Um, I'm not a tin foil hat ultra contrarian so you don't need to worry too much about that but authority has a way of taking power and not giving it back it has a way of seizing privilege and legislating it and then not changing the law afterwards it has a way of keeping emergency powers in perpetuity and um, eagerly rolling them out to seek advantage um, or to uh, perpetuate an agenda that belongs to a particular party or even group within a party's po political ideology. Um, yeah, it's not really supposed to work that way, but unfortunately it often does. So yeah, I worry about it. I also know that it's pandemics and um, massive natural disasters are, these kinds of emergency powers are fundamentally necessary. There's a really important question. Why are they necessary? Well, they're necessary because of us. They're necessary because we cut corners. As human beings, we cut corners. We're all happy to um, adhere to principle, as long as the principle is not costing us too much, as long as uh, we're able to um, make the nice sounding words, um, impress our friends and, and colleagues. Uh, but when the butcher's bill has to be paid, um, an awful lot of people are found missing. Um, it's not easy to act in principle. Um, it's difficult just cognitively knowing what the right thing to do is. It's not always easy to know what the right thing to do is. It's not always easy to recognise that. Well, certainly my, my government here in Australia, the federal government, seems to be struggling with, with the uh, correct balance in terms of getting the, doing the right thing and uh, it's going to come back to bite them. They will not win the next election. They will be crushed as a result of it because it's going to cost a lot of lives. It's certainly going to hurt the economy for longer and more severely. Um, pandemics are the kinds of things you smother very quickly. You crush them. You smother them ruthlessly. Um, and it costs more and takes longer the longer that you wait. The less quickly you leap on such an opponent the more likely it is to proliferate and become a much, much longer and more insoluble problem to resolve. So I, I fear that the horse is bolted in, rel in relation to that. We may still be able to shorten it somewhat, but I don't see us getting out of this in less than six to eight months. But it could be a year and a half for some places, and we could be one of those places if our government continues to be unwise and hesitant and essentially uh, um, dither when it should act more decisively. Um, and it tends to act decisively without telling people how they'll pay their rent. One of the big issues is that we've had wage and income compensation, which has been great, finally, took long enough, but they haven't said anything about rents, which is the single biggest bill that most businesses face. It's one thing to give them cash advances, which are great to cover wages, but they're not gonna cover rent as well. They're just not large enough. Um, we need a rent freeze, we need a, the banks have offered mortgage freezes, so the private sector has actually come to the party, surprisingly, and has offered people six months or even more, in this, if necessary, of mortgage freezes, which is fantastic. Unfortunately, the government hasn't done the same for um, commercial rents, um, so we have, you know, tens of thousands of businesses, hundreds of thousands of businesses, that uh, won't be there in six months time, won't be there, those places will be empty, those uh, businesses will be gone and the people that own them will be in this significant debt and the jobs that they supplied will not come back, not in a hurry anyway. It takes years in many cases to capitalise and build a business um, and it takes a st sufficiently strong economy to provide the capital flow through for those businesses to generate sufficient capital to, to remain alive and viable. So it's a, a feedback loop. 
and it's the government's role to make absolutely sure in these times of crisis that the infrastructure remains uh, and the businesses themselves remain frozen in stasis until such a time as they can grow back green shoots back into the economy. Um, our government is dragging its feet still. We're still waiting to find out if they're going to do anything about rents. If you don't subsidise rents as well as wages, if you don't cover rents as well as wages, you're simply very marginally delay, delaying the inevitable. Most businesses, just like most workers, don't have enormous cash reserves. So um, if you're going to give them money for their, their for, to pay their workers, but they're going to end up with nowhere to do their business once the economy returns and wakes up again and restarts, then you have effectively only bought yourself a few months of income for the workers and for the, uh, the out of work proprietors and then they will have nowhere to go. And that is the, the economic reality that we find ourselves in um, here in Australia and I can see from what I'm looking at elsewhere in the world too. Um, it seems to me that an aggressive approach is the one that's required and uh, essentially putting your economy into a deep freeze is also a requirement and uh, we are dragging our feet, retail is still operating, uh, we've closed gyms, we've closed a lot of places where people are congregating but we've left our schools open though many of them are shutting voluntarily and state by state some of the states have shut them, Victoria shut them. Um, We've left so much retail open still, even though they're languishing, withering on the vine, to be to be honest. Um, it's just a wishy-washy, weak approach to solving this problem. Um, I see only two effective solutions. We, we, we allow COVID to move through society and destroy it, and it collapse our economy far more viciously than it would if we jumped on it aggressively, which is the other option. Um, we're not really doing that right now. Uh, we're, we're if I watched a fighter fighting this way, I would describe him as being hesitant and trying to win through knockout blows and not committing and jumping in and out and not, not uh, following a game plan that wasn't going to do more than extend the fight. It wasn't going to win it for him. He's going to lose it in the end and he's just lengthening the torture and uh, taking a beating in the process and unfortunately that's where I think Australia's headed um, unless there's some drastic changes in the next week or so. Um, having said enough about that, um, I suspect there are many people in many countries who are feeling the same way about their governments. It does seem to be that there's a distinct lack of quality and moral character in many of the people that uh, are in charge at the moment, uh, a lack of conviction and a lack of reason and logic. Um, far too many of our political leaders seem to have m far too many masters. Their masters are us and um, pr they wish be primarily doing what's best for the population uh, rather than um, adhering to some ideological premise of the economy. The economy is organic, the economy is flexible, the economy is made of people and infrastructure. Preserve the infrastructure, preserve the people, and the economy will spring back in a matter of weeks to months. Okay? Doesn't necessarily, we won't be in a recession for a while afterwards, probably yes, but it will be substantially better than it would have been otherwise if we preserve everything. And I feel as if governments are busy trying to maintain the status quo for as long as possible, minimise the imminent damage and thus they are magnifying the uh, delayed damage down the track, um, which uh, we're all familiar with that now, with the woeful com uh, quality of so many leaders in the last 20, 20 25 years. Um, And the reason that worries me so much is because when you have low quality leaders, very populist orientated leaders, whether they be left or right is irrelevant, uh, they have a tendency to grab power. They have a tendency to um, 
take advantage. There are scheming opportunists, populists are always scheming opportunists. You only have to look at, uh, at our Scott Morrison or Boris Johnson or, or Donald Trump and you'll see they're, they're very good at taking advantage of um, dire and unexpected circumstances. They won't let an opportunity go to waste and they're certainly going to use that. And um, one of the ways in which they will use that is to garner emergency powers which are required and necessary because people are slack, because people don't want to face the reality and don't want to control themselves and have trouble controlling themselves and disciplining themselves. We've had it easy for a very long time. This is a definitely a, an unprecedented uh, calamity that befalls us. Um, so as a result of that, as a result of us, and we must bear responsibility as a population, as an electorate for that, um, we are handing a very large amount of power over to people who are not particularly trustworthy. Uh, it is a testament to the uh, structural strengths of democracy itself that um, the very poor litany of leaders in the US, and in the UK even more so, and, and certainly here in Australia, most of all, um, have has not uh, have has not they've not been able to do more damage than they've already done. Uh, for that, I'm very grateful. The system works to at least to some degree. Um, but this is precisely the kind of disaster that can hand the reins over to unworthy people to you know, rationalising oligarchs all too easily and we need to be very careful of that. This will pass. We will come up with better and better. There's Plaquenil and there's uh, the um, malaria drug and the HIV drugs and they're proving to be quite effective in treating, in treating the symptoms of COVID and removing it from the body. There's a vaccine that will probably be out by next year. So at some point in the next probably six to 12 months, COVID will be a memory or at least a receding and minor issue rather than the massive issue it is now. And uh, it is at that point that we may begin to realize that we have, um, the reins are still being pulled rather tightly and it will be our responsibility. As has been the past after the Spanish flu and the polio epidemics to um, remind the government that those emergency powers are only for emergencies and need to be handed back. And the institutions that we have are still strong enough to enforce that, provided there's enough popular popular support for um, a withdrawal of governmental power. Um, it's something we need to remember, something we need to stay focused on even during these times because um, after things like pandemics and natural disasters, uh, the greatest threat to human beings is authoritarian creep within our civilization. Um, it's well worth keeping an eye on and we're worth uh, paying attention to. And we'll have a lot of time for that <laughs> over the next six to 12 months, spending a lot of time at home. Uh, so keep an eye, observe. We have the internet, we have communication, we can let our feelings be heard, we can coordinate and organise even if we can't be together and we can create weight and impact um, to make sure that we keep the reins on our leaders rather than have those reins thrust over us. Um, it's important to establish a relationship again as a fighter and as a coach in martial arts it, it is exceedingly important in combat to uh, know yourself, know your role, know what the mission is, know what you need to do, and then prosecute that with 100% aggression, intelligence, and flexibility, uh, and, and to impose that upon whatever threatens you. And governments are the most powerful and useful tool that people have also one of the greatest dangers, possibly the greatest danger that we ever encounter outside of nature itself. So keep that in mind over the coming months. Please stay safe, look after each other, be patient. It's going to be trying for all of us locked up in 
more or less locked up in our houses for months at a time be patient it will come to an end um, if you feel your emotions bringing, br brimming and bubbling up give yourself those extra few seconds if there's one thing I can say about that is you have a choice no matter how volcanic and overwhelming it might be or depressing or whatever that strong emotion is breathing controlling the way your body feels focusing on the on the emotion itself rather than identifying with it giving yourself time to, to process it there goes my light giving yourself time to process it will help you enormously in getting past that feeling um, as a sci-fi nerd I love the the James Her uh, was it James Herbert's uh, phrase from June uh, that uh, he, I will not fear fear is the mind killer fear is the little death that brings total obliteration and he goes on in that phrase to talk about allowing the fear in and through him and then looking back behind him to see its path and when it's gone, there is nothing, only him or her, as may be the case. Allow the emotion in, observe it, breathe, don't identify with it. It's just a feeling. Let it go, let it go. And if you can't let it go, hold it long enough to go outside and breathe. And if that doesn't work, do some yoga, do some martial, martial arts maneuvers and shadow spa, do some push-ups, do some sit-ups, stretch, um, recite poetry, jump up and down, jumping jacks, whatever it takes. Meditate. But what you're feeling isn't real. What you do is real. What you're going to say in response to that feeling is real. And that will resound, that will have impact. But the feeling inside you, it's just the transient action between the axons and dendrites in your neurons. That's all it is. It's just a signal. You don't have to heed it. So I've ranted on enough about uh, the things that are on my mind at the moment. It's a bit incoherent, so I hope you don't mind. Um, but yeah, chill. Be cool. Be kind. Talk again soon. Ciao.